As a small business owner, you deserve more. More confidence, more connectivity, more of the tools that help your business thrive. And at Cox Business, you can expect more from us. We don't just have sales reps. We have perfect plan identifiers. People who will work with you to make sure your business gets everything it needs and nothing that it doesn't. Your business deserves more, and that's why you can expect more from Cox Business. Call 800-526-8572 to switch today. There's nothing more predictable in life than the unexpected. Lightning will always strike. Hail will fall on roofs. Fortunately, there's AAA. AAA has been helping members stay prepared for over 100 years. So when unusual storms, fallen debris, or sudden leaks happen, you'll be covered. Check, check, and check. Get the home and auto insurance you need by talking with a AAA insurance agent today. Visit AAA.com slash insurance or stop by your local AAA store. If you prefer real mornings, shouldn't you have a real breakfast? At McDonald's, we get real about breakfast. That's why you can have a savory sausage biscuit with delicious hash browns for only $1.50. It's time to wake up breakfast. Single item at regular price. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. Thoughts of suicide may feel impossible to overcome. But with help and support, you can find hope in unity. Call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK to speak to a counselor or visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org. It's free. It's confidential. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And even if it feels like it, you're not alone. Welcome to Cyber Wars. Um, I think that I'm still like the Cyber Dude, and I believe that the guy I have with me tonight is probably Ordy Packard. Is that you, Ordy? I there's a good chance it could be. I can neither confirm nor deny this, and on the advice of my attorney, I plead the Fifth Amendment. You know what? That's a great answer. That is the best answer in, in our second segment tonight because I don't want to bury this lead because I hyped it a little bit on um, Twitter. So we're going to do it in the second segment, but that really fits with the whole congressional testimony Every, theme we have going tonight. Everything I know about the law, I learned watching mm. the Oliver North hearings. Oh, right. right. <laughs> Did you, could you hear that? She's, yeah. <laughs> she's very talky today, and she has been all she's day. Very, she's, a, she's a chatty girl. She is a chatty girl, but um, she's got cheese How in you her doing, Lou? How's your week? Crazy, as you know. Crazy? It's very crazy, yeah. Crazy. Um, we yeah. were, so we had a really good um, uh, run there where we didn't have to take any time off for the longest time. And, and we actually had a, 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 ch- a show chocked full of nuts for you last week. We did. We did. And then Monday, um, it was Monday morning. Now, over the weekend, my dad tells me, yeah, you know, my throat's really hurting. So, I mean, you know, you can imagine what this daughter number two did. So, yeah, so I freaked out a little bit. I was like, you talk to your doctor. Talked to him last week. They didn't want you to get a test. 
No, they wanted to wait, and I was like, so then I was a little bit livid. So, so Monday we find out he had to go get, you know, a COVID test. And so I was a little bit rattled, a little bit shaken up, you know, because he didn't tell me about it till Sunday. He had had the sore throat already for I don't even know how long. Like, I don't even know how long he'd had that sore throat. So I was a little bit, like, rattled on Monday. Like, even more rattled than your dad has to have a test for the itis, yeah, it, for the Rona. It, it's like... It's like you were talking about two hours before we went on the air with Fubar, Flubar, he started developing a pretty gnarly fever, too. Yeah, he did. That's right. His, his fever, um, I, yeah, it was like six or seven o'clock, he, he told or something like that. He told me his fever was going up. It got to 100.3 that night. So that was why, yeah, I bailed out of Fubar, oh, too. Bit of fever. Yeah, I, I, I know it is. It was. It's, I mean, both of us, our fever runs at like ninety-seven degrees anyway. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's a few degrees too high. We're, so we were worried Monday night, but Tuesday, he was feeling much better. We went and got the test. Wednesday, we got the results. So we got the results, and I don't know, like twenty-eight to thirty hours or something like that, which I thought was was pretty good. Yeah, um, and of course he was negative, or you know, I wouldn't be talking about mm. it in this. Um, kind of tone of voice that I'm talking about it right now. But so he was fine. He was negative. Mm. He's good to go. We're all good to mm. go. The funny thing was that his um, his uh, advice for or the instructions for if you test negative were to be safe, self quarantine for seven days. Which I took that to mean all of us, right? So he tested negative. <laughs> I'd been around him. So, but. So I thought that was kind of weird. If you test negative, you're self quarantined for seven days anyway. Well, that's because the virus onset is about five days. So yeah, yeah. You know, well, he if, was symptomatic. If, if, you, right? if you were kind, yeah, that's what I mean. If you were symptomatic, but you, the test is still coming up negative, you, yeah, the five day that that makes sense to me. A week makes sense to me. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he's so, like, so he, he got he's he's free today. Yeah, yeah. So I was a little nuts. I had him checking his temperature, his temperature, his uh, and his oxygen like every hour. And I would text, sure. I would text him right because he has a smartphone now at eighty three years old. He said for his eightieth birthday, he bought himself an iPhone. <laughs> this man runs circles around me. It's like, I mean, he's like. He, and he he doesn't have an ounce of fat on him, so he didn't really have like the dangerous comorbidities or anything. But it's still scary. I mean, you know how it is. They're your yeah. parents. They're your parents. It's your job to take care of them. How exactly. Is your, how was your week? And how was Mother's Day and all that? Oh, Mother's Day was great. Yeah, I talked about it a little bit on Fubar. It was really cool. Is that you know for Mother's Day, my mom's favorite Chinese restaurant. They do this uh, champagne buffet on Mother's Day. Well, obviously because of the COVID. Um, we couldn't go to that. So we ordered Chinese at home and they delivered a bottle of champagne and a nice handmade card. It was really sweet of them. So I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, yeah, no, last week was my busy week with the foo bars and the culture shifts and everything. And this week I'm just kind of sailing. So I'm having a good week. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 I think I'm, um, Still probably getting my head on straight a little bit. Um, but then it's, I mean, you know, today is seven days. So, yeah. So, yeah. But we're feeling better yeah. about things. So, but we've got a show tonight. We jam-packed one again tonight since you had to miss our jam-packed last week. We jam-packed jam -packed one tonight. And, um, yeah, we're really, it's, Ordi is really excited to um, bring you some Really important Windows news. What's happening? Yeah. What's happening in the Windows well, world? Well, Windows being Windows is uh, um, <laughs> that's hilarious. I just got a uh, malware bytes shutting down an ad from bleeping computer. Uh, so, um, wow, that's hilarious. So yeah, Windows in their infinite wisdom wants to confuse everybody by releasing version two thousand four in two thousand twenty. And what this is, this is the new uh, feature release that they, you know, they've been really good at keeping their promises of doing a TikTok release schedule where rather than every 18 months releasing a new operating system that we would all have to buy. They're sticking with 
Windows 10 being the last Windows they're going to make and doing a feature update in the spring and basically a service pack in the fall. So they really jam-packed this one with uh, a lot of new features. Uh, one of the ones, and this is the big one, is that you can now limit the bandwidth that Windows is allowed to use when doing its downloads and its updates. Before, it would clog up your connection, which you know, you're talking about 500 megabytes on their fall service packs, and their feature packs in the spring are like 2 gigabytes. So that's a lot of download. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely it is. I, and I think that um I mean that and and some of their some of the other stuff that that they're doing is kind of it's like like where have you been, right? Cuz and we've been talking about some of the changes that they've been making like ongoing on this show, right? Already they've been Yeah. Yeah, they they've really been doing um it's like they finally get it. You know, we talked a little bit ago about how they finally switched. They gave up, you know, fighting everything, and they went with a Chromium base. They changed their edge to Chromium base, and we got some uh, edge news after this too. But they've really been starting to, like, I think because they're not constantly going into the 18-month release cycle, they're focusing on – quality of life improvements. It's like there's a lot of Cortana improvements in uh, this upcoming feature release. Uh, they've moved drivers to optional downloads, which if you're a gamer, you know that Windows overtaking your, um, downloading your drivers just because sometimes they're rolling your drivers back on you and putting even older drivers than you're currently running on there because it's what Windows recommended driver. So, I, it, and they've moved that to optionals, and they, they've really, they've packed in a lot of new features. And that, like we talked about before the show, um, they've expanded, they started doing sandbox mode last year at this time. And so now they're adding the accessibility features into the sandbox mode and everything, too. Now, if you want to explain sandbox mode to them for people who aren't familiar with what that means in Mac... Well, what it mean, what it means is Mac is in Mac is they send and they do this on your iPhone if you use an iPhone or your iPad or everything that you have from Apple. Like all the applications are um, separated from the main operating system, so the uh, file system and the operating system are separate. So um, it's almost like running two separate file systems on. On the app, on any application, any Apple or Mac application that you're using, so or operating system, sorry, that you're using, so everything is um, separated, I, for lack of a better word, by a firewall, right? And, and I'm talking about a, like a firewall in a building. So there's like a barrier between anything that you download or install and your operating system. So. It doesn't completely eliminate the ability for downloaded malware to affect your operating system, but it definitely limits their ability to do so. Yeah, it's a hardening feature of your... Yeah. I mean, you know, it's what we always talk about. Nothing is foolproof to a sufficiently talented fool. So, I, you know, it's, it, it, it's, another, it's another layer of protection. that it, it isolates your programs from your core OS. And, you know, speaking of that, too, one of the new features of Windows 10 that they've had around since Windows 10 re released, but this is new to Windows, is the um, they have three different ways. The, the days are gone where you have to completely format your computer if something goes cataclysmically wrong, where now they have you can do a factory reset where it saves all your files, but it deletes all your registry entries and all your apps. Uh, they have one that's just a complete purge. And then the one they're adding in this new update because you still had to sit there and wait for the entire version of Windows to download and get prepacked before you could do it. Now they're doing it from cloud-based. So you can just download it. So when you do one of these recovery options, it downloads the newest version of Windows 10 and then installs it and then spools it. So that's really, that's huge for people like myself who are fiddly and format their computer every couple months. Yeah, and that that's kind of what I meant by, you know, it, They've been making improvements to certain things. And it's like, I will give them this. Like, for all the shit we give Windows, right? I will give them this. They know their weaknesses. And they know their audience. So, the 
what you were talking about and some of the other things that we've talked about that you haven't talked about yet that, that, that you're going to talk about are the and the improvements that they've made in certain things along the way. That's one of them. Like the, the ability to partially reset or fully reset or completely wipe and reload your operating system. You know, having those choices to make it run better, yeah. make it run better because they know it's bloaty, right? They know their weaknesses. Those are the kind of things that they're doing. And it's, um, it, it's not, it's not necessarily impressive from a development perspective because, you know, if you're, um, if you were perfect, uh, nobody's perfect, but you know, you didn't get it right the first time, but at least you kept trying, I guess. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And in the past, I mean, going all the way back to NT 4.0 and Windows 95, even 3.1, rather than fix their problems, I mean, they'd do a service pack halfway through the life cycle of the operating system, but they'd just say, you know, we'll just make a new operating system in 18 months. And since they have committed to stop doing that, they've actually focused on their quality of life and their security fixes, which is impressive. So I, I'm going to give hats off to Microsoft. They don't suck as much as they used to. Yeah, and they're... Um... Yeah, yeah, and that I mean, you know, and that's that's another thing. They made a commitment. And they, you know, they're trying to stick to it, and it's really, <laughs> it's really kind of impressive. They used to, like you said, they just put band aids on stuff and fix security flaws, and then there'd be a whole other operating system for you to learn because it, they weren't. And maybe this was a user experience thing. Probably was. I, they would change the the GUI enough that. I mean, you'd be like, I got to learn. I mean, every two and a half or three years, they would change it completely, like from XP to seven. And you'd be like, I got to well, learn. Go ahead. That was the main fiasco with Windows 8 was everybody fucking hated it. Yeah, exactly. Because they, they, they thought tablets and phones were going to be the way everybody was going, and gamers are like, noop. Right. You yeah. know, streamers, streamers are noop. YouTube, you know, content creators, nope, nope, we, we want our big desktop, we want our behemoth, we want our laptops, nobody wants to use a tablet. So they, they, they even just shit canned Windows 9 and went straight into 10. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, <coughs> um, excuse me, that I don't have the COVID, we did, we did this in Bar too, somebody coughed, yeah. no, I don't, um, at least I don't think I do, I guess really, I was, none of us really know. Yeah, so did you cover all of the changes, or do we have more? Well, yeah, and Windows 10, I mean, a lot of the other changes, it's uh, you know, one of the things with Cortana, they've made it where she can now launch apps and uh, close apps, and she's becoming more uh, Google Assistant, Amazon Echo style. She's a better but, spy uh, than she's ever been. Yes. Yes. Yeah, she is. Yeah, and she's doing much more for the Bill and Melinda Gates foundation that she ever has in the mm -hmm. past. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, that, that's the major features of the new uh, windows 10 uh, update coming out. In fact, I've already got some elements of it on my computer now. So it's slowly spooling its way mm -hmm. into your computers as we speak. <laughs> but also, <laughs> <Lovely>. <laughs> yeah, right. Lovely. Whether you want it to or not. I know, um, right. One of the other things while we're talking about Microsoft is we've talked about Edge and their new change with Chromium. They had two major updates that are in beta right now that are going to be released soon, and both of these are really, really good for your security, and I hope that it just doesn't get it bloaty. Um, well, they might get it bloaty, but they might get it right after. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's well, that's the and that and that's the thing um, about kind of the way that they've changed their um, their mo a little bit, right? So they might get it right yeah. eventually, but secure. I mean, them to for them to focus on security is not a bad thing because they're you know most people use Windows, so it's you know it's really easy. Malware development to just develop for Windows, and it's there's a lot in it that's very malware friendly. So, yeah, and you know we we've talked about you know one of the bonuses with uh, Microsoft Edge is the syncing, where you can go to any computer 
and uh, just log in with your Microsoft account. And as long as they have Edge, then you've got you know all of your bookmarks and favorites and everything. Basically, they took a page out of what you can do with Chrome. But the two of the new features they're putting in, um, one of them I really like. And if you spend any time on the internet whatsoever, this has grown to be fucking annoying. And they have an option where you can go into silent mode where you will no longer receive those. Do you want to get notifications from this website? Allow block. They, it, it just suppresses them automatically. Mm -hmm. So yeah. those pop-ups don't pop up because those have actually been, um, re those have become a, an avenue for malware um, delivery as well. Because another little arrow will pop under it saying click click uh, allow. So and once you click allow, then it starts spooling in malware and ads and everything else into your browser. Right. Yeah. So so with with Microsoft Edge shutting this down by you know you when you turn on that setting, it's just another you know protecting you from yourself where you you don't just get that off my screen. You think you clicked block, but you actually clicked allow. And now right. all, all of a sudden you've got zoom installing on your computer. Yeah. Well, mouse slips happen, right? Um, sure. Yeah. So, uh, bad fingers. Yeah. And, I mean, stuff happens. So, um, sure. it, I think it's, you know, I think it's a good thing. I kind of, I like where they're going. Um, I think it's, I think it's, again, knowing your weaknesses and knowing your audience, right? So, I mean, it's not, it's super computer savvy people. Um, I mean, they, they've just got a lot of kids, moms, and elderly people using their product. So, they need, yeah. to, they need to build things in to protect them, right? Because, I mean, my mom would have... Totally clicked allow every time, no matter what. I thought I was supposed to click yes. Right. No, mom, you're not always supposed to click yes. But you never click yes. Yeah. Right. Ever. So, right. So. Yeah. <laughs> so and yeah. with these changes, Microsoft Edge has actually knocked Firefox down, and we talked about that a few weeks ago, where it is now the second most downloaded browser. Now, you could attribute a lot of that to a lot of people checking out the changes for when they went to Chromium, saying, okay, what are they doing now? Mm -hmm. But if it holds, then that took them absolutely no time to dethrone Firefox as number two. Yeah, there's been a, I've, I've seen a lot of, um, and I, I probably should have looked at it more, I, um, except I was really caught up, and you guys will find out why I've been caught, so caught up in this CrowdStrike thing. So, um I probably should have looked at it more, but I just noticed yesterday that there's a lot of buzz in the forensics community about the edge, the new edge changes and um, not just forensics, but an in incident response. So there, and I know, you know, I know that, that the security um, things that, that you've talked about, just like with, you know, blocking um, the, communication from websites like that I think that's a big I think that's a big part of it so there's a lot of buzz and a lot of them especially the ones that are forced to use windows for work are pretty much saying to that that everybody needs to change their default to edge now now they're not always right about everything but they do a good job of researching products so that caught my attention, but I just noticed that they were doing it yesterday. So, yeah, and uh, I'm sure some of that has to do with the um, another new update in Edge too, and this is a, on the security front, is that they're allowing more smart screen integration into the browser where itself, where it will now, by default, block unwanted apps that are downloaded via click once or direct invoke. Now, if you've ever wondered how you got all of those goddamn browser tabs browser bars on your browser in Internet Explorer, that is they either used click once or direct invoke, where it would install that along with some malware in your computer, and you would all of a sudden have a new toolbar for Yahoo, Google, whatever, mm -hmm. um, price, price line, any number of things. So this blocks those apps, and that's a uh, 
automatically. And that is a really large distribution source of malware on the internet is the click once. Yes. Yeah, so. absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, so th- I think this has a lot to do with it, but they are really promoting the use of it on windows. So I think that's, um, I think that's a really interesting thing. So I, I think it's definitely something to pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah. So big, big news from Microsoft this week. It's, I mean, it, like you said, they're getting it. They're, yeah. Slowly but surely they're getting it. And the, the more Apple becomes out of touch with their users, which I know you love Apple, but you can't deny that fact. And, uh, it, it, it's almost, since Bill Gates stepped away from the company, Microsoft gets it. Yeah, I I think that Apple definitely needs to pay attention to what's going on. Um, the I, I I definitely think they need to pay attention and and to watch Microsoft and their products specifically um, because you know the the two companies people don't necessarily understand how different the two companies are because. Microsoft does not produce its own hardware. Where no. Apple is like really primarily a hardware company. Yeah. Microsoft. It, I mean, they, they'll, they'll use equipment made by AMD or Intel or whatever, but it's very specific. So that way that you don't have that mm-hmm. driver problem that you have with Microsoft where they're, you know, they, it's designed to work on any computer and it really works on none of them very well. Apple right. is very specific that, you have right. one of three video cards. You have one of three processors. You have X amount of RAM, and all of them have this type of hard drive. On and, them. Our, and an operating system and very little software, where Microsoft yeah. makes a lot of software. And, right. uh, and, that, and most of it, well, a whole lot of it, there's not even an Apple equivalent, equivalent for it. Like, it, when I got my Mac... I had to get an office suite of programs. Well, I got Microsoft Office for Mac. Duh. Sure. So, I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, I, did, I could have done a less, uh, well, I, a less robust. Star, I could, yeah, 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 but they're, I mean, they're kind of less they're robust. They, yeah. they're, they're less robust. They're not, you know, they're open source. They're free, a lot of them, but sure. they're, but they're not as, as robust and they don't really work as well. So, you know, there's a so there's a big difference between the two companies, but they still and Microsoft sells its operating system to Dell, uh, HP, Lenovo. You know, anybody Acer. that yeah, yeah, Acer, yeah, whoever will buy you know whoever will buy it, which is anybody making laptop or desktop hardware, and everybody else uses Microsoft. So they're very very different still. The competition in the debt in in the hardware uh, or the device market is between Apple and Microsoft, but it's everybody selling the Microsoft product. But Microsoft is making money every time you buy one of those products. Sure. So at any rate, that's a crazy explanation. That's still, <laughs> but that's that's still the competition, and that's why it's the two of them. So we're going to go to a break real quick. Um. And there's one other thing that we were going to tell you. We won't really go into it in great detail. But a few weeks ago, we told you a about a site that was um, called, that was taken down by the government that was selling leaked data from all these different hacks. Like what the Twitter hack was on there and you could go in and check to see if you're, Twitter account was hacked, but you could also buy a, a bunch of other people's software of uh, passwords. Yeah, but the website was literally called WeLeakData.com. We leak data. Well, evidently, there's <laughs> someone <laughs> leaked the user accounts that included chat logs from the hackers on the site that were exchanging, selling, and buying leaked data. So the, the best part about this is that this data was actually leaked on the dark web to the highest bidder. Anybody could buy this database if they if they had the the coin to do so. Uh-huh. So it had IP addresses, chat logs, um, 
Bose post, you know, all, all the fame fagging going on and just all of it. And, and, so. and, gar- and guarantee, yeah, because it was like a hacker forum where they're, you know, they're, they're fame fagging and, you know, doing, there's no telling what they were doing in there. If you've ever seen a hacker forum, um, they're, pr- it's pretty funny. But if, um, so guaranteed either the government or like FireEye or, you know, uh, CrowdStrike, which we're about to talk about, um, or maybe multiple. Like the gov- any of them, yeah. yeah, yeah, they probably all bought it, and then you know, the <laughs> Cybel, yeah, the mm-hmm. art, the story we got on Bleeping Computer, uh, they talk about how Cybel did buy the information, so and yeah, they actually, they, they actually added the information to amibreached dot com, which is kind of hilarious that you know everybody else who's getting dinged by hackers is now those hackers are on the site for getting dinged too. That is hilarious. So we're going to take a quick break and we will be right back to talk about things. Evidently nobody but me noticed about the crowd strike testimony to, um, Trey Gowdy's committee. It's really riveting kind of stuff. So we'll be right back. We've been shot up, beat up by the fall of the arrow. Yeah, full of deep cuts right down to the marrow. But there's no doubt we get out from the bottom of the barrel. But even then, he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq. Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible. Affordable. Relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call Oh, our flag is and our bones are shattered, but it doesn't matter because we're moving Round them up, round them up, let's go. Round them up, let's go. All eyes are seeing red. Double vision from the blood we shed. The only way of leaving is dead. That's the state of mind, state of mind, state of mind. All righty then, we're back. So, um, already pulled my notes up and... He's got them, and I don't write at the moment. So let's see how that's going to work out. <laughs> yeah, so everybody, at least everybody in our chat, is going to know that um, there were how many transcripts have been released so far? 85. 80, th- 85. See, I, how'd I know you'd have the number? So 85 transcripts have been released so far of witnesses. That testified before Trey Gowdy's Intelligence Committee, the House Intelligence Committee, when the Republicans were in charge. All of this happened. All of them were pretty much in 2017. Yeah, more or less. Yeah. 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 So, um, 
Now, and and we we know that this was all around the um, Trump Russia, uh, whatever you want to call it. If you want to call it a, a hoax or an investigation, or I don't really care what you call it. So, but it was it was the transcript from CrowdStrike is of course because you guys may probably recognize our audience. I know recognizes that name as the contractor who air quote, investigated the, or who we all thought, you know, investigated the DNC um, hack, which they did. They, I mean, they did really investigate. I mean, to the extent, to the extent that they did, they did. Right. But they, that we, they'd kind of been demonized and I was really suspicious of CrowdStrike this whole time. And, you know, if anybody in the chat has read one of these reports that says what I'm about to tell you, please let me know, because I haven't found it in a report. I haven't seen it anywhere. Um, Maybe, you know, it trickled out here or there, and I didn't put two and two together until I read this transcript. I'm not sure, but this, to me, is the biggest bombshell. Of course, I mean, you know, I'm focused on the the cybersecurity part of it, but this is the biggest bombshell of any that we've seen in all of the transcripts, and there's a lot. What These these transcripts come from the House Intelligence Committee um, interviewing Sean Henry from CrowdStrike. Yeah, it's the Permanent Select Subcommittee on Intelligence, which, you know, is a long, stupid name. But right. at, but at any rate, it was it was Trey Gowdy's subcommittee. He was there in a lot of them. He's not in this transcript anywhere. But there are a couple of guys that um, he did he did pick some good representatives because a couple of them seem to kind of know what they're talking about. Yeah, he got uh, Mike Conway from Texas, who kind of from the reading of the transcripts, it's like he led or at least he led the questioning for the. Republicans in this and from the looks of it it was from the looks of the uh, transcripts it was Schiff and Swalwell who did the majority of the questioning for the Democrats right yeah and a guy named Stewart who knew had an intelligence background but not a cybersecurity background but it really didn't matter their questions are really great and the but the first thing that comes out and really jumped out to me was that and I'm just going to give you the analysis because you can read the transcripts yourself. I don't need to do that for you. Um, but I'll give you my analysis of it. The first thing that comes out is that CrowdStrike was hired. I'm jumping I'm jumping forward, actually, nine months but tra- um, or seven months. CrowdStrike is hired to come in and get the Russians out of the DNC servers, which starts with an investigation of... Who's in here and where are they, right? Because you start removing stuff before you figure out where they are. You might, you'll let them know they're there. They'll pull out. They'll leave something behind so that they can get right back in, right? So they first, they they have to look around for a while and find them. And then they, then their job is to get them out of there and keep them out, right? When they, when they were hired, they were given a timeline from an IT contractor that worked for the DNC. And the timeline starts in September of 2015. So let me know in the chat if you already knew that this was going on. In September of 2015, the FBI calls the DNC and says the Russians course they call them the dukes because that's what the feds call them the dukes are in your system now if i'd been an it contractor that was basically basically just networking and maintaining email and crap like that i would have shit my pants he may he may have but physically yanking cables out of the wall right uh, yeah exactly and 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 then of course ruining all the evidence that was there but at any rate I might have done that if I had been him. Um, But this was September of 2015. In 
somewhere around February to March, he wasn't real sure when, a lawyer at Perkins Coy, who used to work with the president of CrowdStrike, asked him to lunch. Within a month, about within about a month of that, he was calling him to hire him to get the Russians out of the DNC servers. See, so yeah, now this is in March. The, the initial point of attack when the FBI contacted uh, mm. the contractor who run who ran the DNC servers. So we're at almost six months now before a mitigation firm is contacted. So it was like, but it was like March, end of February, mid March, something like that. When they went to lunch, it wasn't April, and it was it, it was April when they were contacted to actually talk about contracting. Correct. Right. So, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, seven months. Yeah. So you yeah. got six, seven months, almost eight months that you have a malicious actor as it comes to find out through this testimony to malicious actors just – Dancing around inside the DNC servers. Dancing bears, exactly. And you guys may remember us talking about Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear. And APT 28 and 29, if you 20, want to go back to the... Right, 28 and 29. And most of, for the longest time, it was all Fancy Bear, Fancy Bear, Fancy Bear. And the guys that were indicted, the 12 Russians indicted for hacking, were... Members supposedly of Fancy Bear. But then we did one show about, well, we did a show about Cozy Bear, and evidently, well, CrowdStrike thinks they were in there too. And now we kind of know why. And I think some of their reports actually did say some things about this. But um, another thing about the timing of this that comes from Henry is that, so they were in there all this time, right? Um, and the FBI knew, and the DNC knew, nobody else knew, and they just let them sit there. And CrowdRise believes that they didn't exfiltrate any emails or data or anything like that until maybe March or April. Yeah, they, they saw that it was all packaged for exfiltration, but they can't say... Or they, they can say with a level of confidence that the data had been, and we are talking... 70 gigabytes worth of data. Well, okay, and, so the 70 gigabytes was from the DCCC. That, oh, is that from the DCCC? Yeah. Yes. Okay, because, yeah, that's the cross-pollination of the two stories. Yeah, that's... and see, I know, it, so it makes it a little bit confusing, but what what happened was, Cozy Bear, wait, no, Cozy Bear, was in the, Cozy Bear was the one that was in the DNC servers for six to nine months. Fancy Even Bear, longer, because they had been in there, they, right. they it it wasn't until because okay this is where it's fun this was my favorite part of it and I'm gonna I'm gonna parse this out and then you give your analysis so Fancy Bear got into the DNC servers through the D Triple C Cozy Bear was already there now if you don't know the difference Fancy mm -hmm. Bear is the GDU that is the Russian mm -hmm. military cyber hackers y yes. Cozy Bear is actual legitimate. That uh, that's the SV FSB. Uh, yeah, FSB. So you you have Cozy Bear that has been sitting in the DNC servers for nobody knows how long. They could have been in there for years and nobody knew it because they were just sitting there sure. reading emails and listening to VoIP calls in <laughs> real time. Right. Fan exactly. Fancy Bear comes dancing their happy asses in from the DCCC server, raising red flags all over the place to the point where the FBI goes, oh, you've been hacked. And it's kind of like that, you know, like when you watch cop shows where you'll see like one department like homicide totally fuck up a drug, you know, so, drug enforcement investigation. Right. That's what that's what Fancy Bear did to Cozy Bear. And that's and that that's where the Repub some the I think it was Conaway looped back and got the timing on that and it was actually not until March or April that Fancy Bear danced their happy ass from the D triple C to the DNC. So right. so it was so Cozy Bear was hanging out in the DNC servers 
and and endpoints. They were on people's computers too, so they were hanging out there for six seven months before Fancy Bear comes dancing their happy ass in <laughs> from the D Triple C, right? And they believe. Now I'm going to say this about CrowdStrike. They had absolutely no choice but to do absolutely everything they did exactly as they did it. Um, they, they were under specific instructions from Perkins Co. Yes. On what to investigate. Is, how Because they were subcontracted through them. The DNC is the one, and, and to some extent the FBI, but, but you can also consider, and at this point... I'm not defending the FBI on shit, so please don't make don't think that I am. However, there's only so much that they could do about what the DNC was doing about it, because the DNC is a political organization, and the um, FBI is law enforcement, and there's only there's only so much that they can do there. The DNC being a private entity, however. They were also the political party of the President of the United States that was President at the time. This is the Obama administration. So they should have done more. They should have put pressure. They should have had the Secret Service. They should, I mean, there's a lot that, there, there's a lot more that they, there's only so much they could have done, but there is a lot more that they could have done. Right? So I will say that. So if Blame goes to anybody. Shocker. It's on the FBI and the DNC. Well, boy, aren't we shocked that that's where the blame lies in all of this. Okay. So, back to the testimony. The, um, so, the DNC, six months after, they, at least, after, they know, not six months after the Russians got there, but six months after they know the Russians are there. They make the wise decision to hire an outside contractor to come in and clean it up. But they do that through their lawyer to cover their ass. So one thing that meant is that counsel from Perkins Cooey or Coy or whatever you want to call it. I think it's Cooey, but whatever. I really don't care. Was in the room during the testimony. There are several places in this... Um, in this transcript where they there there's a privileged side off the record conversation and the answer changes right so there's at yeah, least I, I I actually liked one part of it when one of the um uh one of the representatives said it, he went through his whole question and thing and then got to the end and finally Sean Henry had to go talk to counsel mm -hmm. and uh, the, the representative said, good. I thought I was going to be the only one up here because everybody else who's asked you a question, you had to talk to counsel. At least I once. thought I was the yeah. one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> at least one. I thought I, I thought I was so adept at my job that you were just laughing at me and didn't have to. Right. So I, I found that, but yeah, so it, during every line of questioning from Castro, from Swalwell, from you know, all of them, they had to talk to, Legal counsel before yeah, they answer. Right, exactly. And, um, I mean, you know, I, that makes me, um, it makes me, uh, it, I, I, I can certainly see it. You know, I can certainly, everybody wants to have a lawyer there to protect their interest. But in this particular situation, the DNC needs to be more forthcoming with what the hell happened and to the FBI, to Congress, to everybody, and why aren't they? There's a point where you have to ask yourself what, or ask them, what are you hiding? You know, what, and, you know, I get that. So, on our very first show that we ever had, we talked about, and there's still the audio from Comey, on um, on our site, on on Spreaker and on the site, that where he talks about how the FBI never took possession of the server. They never actually examined the server. 
And we talked on the first show about well, the way that you do that is that you pull a mirror image of the server and you take that back and you use special software and you examine it. And you can yeah, learn Yeah, you don't need the lot. actual hardware. Right. Now, Swalwell is trying to make a point that they did that, but they didn't. And it, so if you read the transcript, you might get the uh, impression from what Swalwell is saying that they actually did take an image of the server and turn it over to FBI and the FBI examine it. But no, that never happened. They never got a server, server image. But what they did get is an image of several computers in the building, several specific computers, not all of them, just a few of them. So whatever the Russians were doing, they were targeting several specific people. Yeah, I, this goes beyond the phishing attack on uh, um, uh, the, they, they, yeah, that, Podesta. They were not part. Podesta, of, they, yeah. they weren't part of that. And according to them, they were not part of that investigation. Right. So, yeah. So you you basically, I mean. I, I will say re in reading the testimony that my opinion of CrowdStrike did change because mm -hmm. it, the way that the media made them out was pretty much just slimy go-to IT guys for the DNC. And that's not the case at all because, you know, it's the, he made it put his point very clear that, yes, he had they have worked for political organizations, but multiple on all sides, you know, whether it be the Texas GOP or, you know, any number of them. So they, they were very clear that they were fairly apolitical um, actors in this whole fiasco. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They, as much as they could be. I mean, the guy was with, Sean Henry was with the FBI for quite a while. Um, I was a little surprised at some of the things that he didn't know or that he appeared not to know. Maybe he was so, and here's, and I'm going to give you one and I might have to do this again because I'm just pulling out things that, um, are, uh, that really stood up, stood out to me. And, and one thing that I deal with a lot, um, and you'll understand why is hash values. And a hash value for uh, a file, whether it's a Word document, an email, um, a, an entire file full of emails, a, you know, a zip file full of documents, whatever, you, run a ha you use an algorithm to run a hash value on that. And that hash value is a fingerprint for that file at a moment in time. If anything, including the date, the, the metadata changes about that file, the hash value will change. When you're examining evidence, you use the hash value, the fingerprint, to verify the fact that you didn't do anything to change that file and to keep the chain of custody. Um, which is an important part about having the Russians in your, your system for six to nine months. That, and this is the point that I didn't make. I got to go back and make this. What they did by doing that, by never having anybody come in, pull logs, pull server images during that time that the Russians were there. It doesn't matter if they bring all of those 12 guys back here and try them. It will never hold up. They obliterated the evidence. The analogy that I gave Stacy for that, it is as if they took DNA evidence from a crime scene, put it in the back of a truck, it rained on it, sat in the sunshine, snowed, hailed, and lightning hit it over a week. And then they took it into the lab and said, oh, we know whose DNA we've got. No, that does not work that way. They were there. Somebody was there for six months. You come in seven months later, watch them for 30 days, and then you say you think you know who, who's been there the whole time. There's a lot that you can know, 
but it doesn't prove anything about what happened the prior six months or it doesn't prove what you need it to prove and the fact that you don't have any direct evidence from that six months hands the defendant the defense that they needed to get off on whatever crime you're trying to convict them of. Does that make sense, Ordy? Oh, yeah, totally. No, and this is what we were talking about. This We kind of glossed over when we were talking about how they could not prove that any of the data was exfiltrated. In that six to nine months, they could have. After that exactly. point, CrowdStrike was just going with circumstantial evidence leads us to believe that the data was right. Exactly. But do they have concrete proof. They do not. And but now they, the other thing with that testimony that I found interesting too, that just kind of got glossed over by everybody was when he was talking about how their contract was done, but they still left some of their tools in there, which is prophylactically, which is what you do mm-hmm. when, when you have that, that as they were concluding their investigation, another threat actor had entered their computers. Mm hmm. Yeah. And that was, nobody asked why, nobody asked who, and at no point did Dean say, well, you know what, maybe we should keep CrowdStrike on for another 30 to 90 days to see who this intruder is. Maybe, because you are who you are, and you've had this problem before, and clearly the people in your organization can't keep from clicking on every link that comes through their email, <laughs> you should always have CrowdStrike or somebody on contract. Yeah, I mean they're like they're like lawyers. They charge bucket time, so you right. know, it's not like you know it, it, you have them on retainer. Right. Well, yeah, so. you have their tools in your their in your system, and a lot of them charge like per hour of use or gigabyte of use or terabyte of use or whatever. Right. So they they charge like that, so they get their return on their investment. Um, so, but. I would have to say, at this point, unless you're trying to cause drama, we've talked a lot about the Russians just creating discourse, right? That's, yeah. That's what, that's what adversaries do, is they create chaos and discourse in a system. So, I, I mean, you know, just I'm, just have a friggin' vendor. I was just still dumbfounded. I mean, they had a vendor, well, but they obviously weren't. But this is what, I was just still I was just so dumbfounded that Fancy Bear went in and just tripped all over Cozy Bear's dick. <laughs> and this is this is you know this, this is intelligence where you know well, and and just like agency, we, we, everybody is so tight in their own agency, they want the caller that they just you know nobody our, talks to anybody. Our agency, well, and our, they compete, and right. our our agencies do it too. They compete. They compete for the bust. They compete for the intel. They compete. They compete for everything. Um, the, so, you know, we talked about the Iranian um, security agencies, and they do the same thing. So, sure. it's, um, I, so yeah, it's not, but it is, it is, it, and especially the way that you said it, it is kind of funny. So, back to the hash values, because this is and always has been some evidence that they put out there from the very beginning was that one of the way that they, ways that they identified um, that they were Russian is that in the metadata for the for the um for one of the dump for one of one of the files or some of the files in one of the dumps and I believe this what I believe it was a DNC dump. It they was DNC, it was the it was the Christopher DNC dump. Yes, and it's and. It, Goosefer was kind Goose of for two, sorry. yeah. Goosefer two was sort of notorious for fiddling with the data, metadata, leaving um, what wasn't a Russian time zone behind. Um, they were, um, and I'm going to drop this in the chat so you guys can see it. But there has been from the beginning, from the first. From May of 2016, June of 2016, when they started talking about this, one of the ways that they identified that these were Russians is the metadata changes and the metadata that they left behind in some of the files. So when they were pressing Sean Henry for the circumstantial evidence and the more than circumstantial evidence and what they had, he said, well, there were some hash values. They got him to elaborate on that. 
the FBI had taken a document that they said they got from a data dump, given it to Sean Henry, and Henry checked it against files, a file or files, it was multiple files, they checked them against files that existed on the DNC servers 12 months later. So, that every yeah, so bad. stop and think about, on one end, you have files that were downloaded, re-uploaded by, and who Shared, knows? Shared, sold, traded. Who knows how many times by a hacker who is notorious for fiddling with metadata. And one point that I had made to Stacy as well is that Hackers wipe and change metadata to cover their tracks all the time before they dump documents. It's If you know anything about hacker culture, they know everything about metadata. They're not going to leave shit behind for you to find to tie shit back to hint them unless they're Koreans and then they get busted. You remember that story? <laughs> yeah. yeah. The PDF files? Yeah. So we did that a few weeks ago or a couple months ago too. So... Because they know they get busted. The North Koreans got busted that way. So, but somehow the FBI had a file that the hash value on that file exactly matched one from the DNC. How do you think they pulled that off? Because it came from the original file and it wasn't from a data dump I, at all? Somebody at the DNC zipped it and emailed it to, to the FBI, yeah. and they said, here you go, CrowdStrike. Wink, wink, check these hash values. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, and, and, yeah, I, yeah. and I'm going to say again that I don't think that CrowdStrike had anything to do with this, because if they manufactured or altered evidence in any way, it would completely destroy their, their reputation in um, in the industry. Completely. I've... I, I know stories. Yeah, they haven't I know been around stories. that long either. They're, you know, they right. haven't, they're not like FireEye and the other ones right. that have been around for ever. Right, right. So I don't, I, I really cannot wrap my head around them having anything to do with any of the shenanigans. I can't prove that anybody didn't know anything about any of the shenanigans, but I can certainly say be, that it is a high probability at this point that all, that any sh shenanigans that did take place took place out of their view and they didn't know about it. I would, I would back that up. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I think yeah. crowd, crowd strike is pretty clean in this and I'm feeling kind of sorry for them getting caught up in it, but you lay down with dogs, man. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. And I'm not saying it, that they should have turned down the contract because you know, I, yeah, you don't, you, you don't yeah. turn down the largest law firm in DC's, especially when you're yeah, fairly who new. They worked with before. Yeah. yeah, they had been around like what a year at that point. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, just under two. Yeah, yeah, and I mean they had some really great hot hires. They had really experienced people on their staff because they'd made great hires. But you know, I I, I have to wonder if they. If the DNC said, let's hire them, they're a new company. Maybe we can get over on them. Get us some dupes. I'm not saying it happened. I'm just saying that it it smells like a friggin' fish market. Yeah, no, it definitely, there, there's, Yeah, it's Patsy-esque. Yeah. Not saying they were entirely a Patsy, but they did get kind of thrown under the bus. I, I feel, yeah, I feel like, because they, because they hired them through their lawyer, they had them do this air quote, third party thing they, where they were working directly with the FBI. And why wouldn't, why would a company like CrowdStrike not have a certain level of confidence about working with the FBI? Yeah. Right. So they're doing, they're doing all of their work, doing it pretty standard industry style. Um, the only thing that I didn't hear which you wouldn't necessarily expect to hear somebody say this about their client. But the one thing I would have liked to have heard Sean Henry say at least once that um, being called in six months after a, a client actually knew they had hackers in their system, 
would be a bit irregular. I mean, at least I would want him to say, you know, so it's actually highly irregular, but I would want him to say that it was a bit irregular. Yeah. That would have been fair. Right. Exactly. Cause I mean, if you know, you have malware on your system, how long do you let it sit there? Uh, it's gone that moment. Uh, it, if, if it was a Russian hacker, what would you do? Like I said, I would have ripped the cable out of the wall. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I, yeah, so, yeah, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, waiting that long, that, that's just, uh, somebody was set up somewhere or the whole thing was just complete. Something is screwy in Denmark. Well, and it, we've said this about, so, right. We, we've said this about so many things throughout the Obama administration, right? So we were still in the midst of the Obama administration and throughout the Obama administration, how many times did we say they are either completely incompetent or to- incompetent or totally dirty? About everything, uh, all the time. Pretty, pretty much, yeah, pretty much. So, yeah, so that's it for now on that. I don't know if I'll find anything else that'll be worth really talking about. But you know, I've been trying to go back and compare all of his testimony to the reports that they did in the past. Um, because I know that their reports were redacted. The, um, law firm or the FBI or both had redacted information from their reports and not allowed them to release it. So I don't know. I'm looking for things that were hidden from the public, left out of the reports that are actually included in the transcript, but those are the big, there are a couple. Those are the bullet points. Those are the big bombshells. Those are the big bombshells. Then there were a couple of other little ones, but those are the big ones. So, um, what you got going on this week, Gordy? I've got, um, I'll be filling in for, I believe I'm still filling in for Dan on Wednesday night on Robinson and Wright. And then Friday night, I've got juxtaposition with Rick. What else you got going on this week? Who are you producing for? Who are you uh, talking with? Tuesday, Wednesday at 9. So Tuesday's Aggie, whoever she happens to be with that week, and whatever show she happens <laughs> believe, to be doing. This, I, I, I believe it's Brad this week. It's Is it? I thought it was he said, she said. Oh, yeah, because I was off last week. So, yeah, it's probably yeah, going to be Brad again. Uh, pod divided yet again. And Wednesday night will be red wine. As you guys, blue bars off. And Friday Correct. night, I'll be on with Aggie and Bod at 8.30. So, typical week. And we have a full lineup here at KLRN.net. Dot net. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, thanks for joining us tonight, guys. We love you for checking in, as always, and hope you enjoyed it. But we will see you next Monday, right back here. Have a good week. No matter where you go, there you are. Exactly. I'll take care.